Hi everyone, we're back. Today we're going to do a build with the Pentium 2 that we did in the last video. So we'll go through the whole thing, um, I'll walk you through the parts I'm going to use, how we're going to put it together, we'll do a build, we'll do an install, we'll do some benchmarks, and we'll play some games. So let's get into it. So here we have the Pentium 2 board. This is the same board that we used last time. This is the Intel SC440BX-2. Now I picked this motherboard because uh, this was one of the final motherboards released by Intel for the Pentium 2. It was kind of their cream of the crop flagship board. Um, has the 440BX chipset, um, but this was kind of their most expensive board at the time. Um, I believe it was released in June in 1998 or maybe 1999. Um, it was a late uh, Pentium 2 board. So um, now this board came in around US $285 uh, when it was launched. So it was pretty high up on the, on the price scale there. So, um, you know, needless to say, I got this one pretty cheap off eBay. Um, so this board supports a 66 megahertz or a 100 megahertz front side bus. So it does support the full range of Pentium 2 processors from the 233 all the way up until the 450, I believe, or 500. Um, and so what we'll be doing today is we'll be running this with the 400 megahertz chip so there'll be a 100 megahertz front side bus with a four times multiplier which will give us uh, 400 megahertz I've also managed to match most of the RAM I had some PC100 RAM but I've got one PC133 stick in here um, we'll be using 228 meg sticks and a 64 meg stick uh, this will make 320 megabytes of RAM this board only supports a maximum of 382 megabytes of RAM with the BIOS so you can only maximally put uh, three 128 meg sticks in here unfortunately I don't have three 128 meg uh, PC100 or PC133 sticks I've only got two um, so I've sufficed with a 64 meg I do have some 256 meg sticks but this board will not support a single 256 meg sim no, so you cannot put that in there. Um, I did have another choice of motherboard, so I ended up getting another Pentium 2 board, which was running a Gigabyte GA686 uh, board, I believe it was a 686BX. So it is the 440BX chipset. Um, it only had a 233 or 266 megahertz processor on it. Now I did some research um, into the boards, you know, the Intel boards versus the Gigabyte boards. There was nothing that I could really find that would say, you know, one board is better than the other. Um, so I did decide to go with the Intel board. Um, it just does, it seems to have some higher quality parts on it. So, you know, it's got some good quality Nichicon caps and stuff on it here. Um, it just seems to be a better build quality and it's running the same chipset. So, um, if anybody knows whether this board or the uh, Gigabyte GA686BX is a better board, let me know. Um, the only physical difference really I could find was the Gigabyte board had an extra ISA slot. So it had three ISA slots, four PCIs and an AGP. It also, the Gigabyte board also supports more RAM. It supports up to one gigabyte of RAM and it has four uh, SIM slots and it will take a 256 meg uh, SIM in each slot. Um, again, I don't have that much PC100 and PC133 RAM to go in it. Um, so, you know, that was one factor I was looking at, but in the end I did decide to go with the Intel board. So this is the one we'll be using in the build today. Okay, so the sound card we're going with is a classic Sound Blaster Live. Uh, so I picked this one up uh, pretty cheap as well. Got a good deal with an ATX case, uh, which I'll show you shortly. Um, so this is the original Sound Blaster Live from 1998. It's model CT4620. Um, it, unfortunately I don't have the CT4660 daughter board that comes with this so it has a daughter board that attaches to these pin headers here and gives you the digital in-out um, SPDIF, external SPDIF um, connectors I don't have that unfortunately, it would be nice to have it to complete the build but I'm really not going to use um, digital in and out on this PC anyway. Um, so I'm happy with this. It supports uh, four speaker surround so it has uh, Sound Blaster or Creative's EAX 2.0 um, this card was released in August of 1998, um, so it does kind of fit the, the time frame for the build we're doing, so um, this probably would have been one of the better cards you could get back in 1998 from Creative, uh, so this is the one that we're putting in today. Um, it uses the EMU 10K1 uh, chip on here, so that's this one here, um, which again, like I said, supports EAX 1.0 and 2.0, which is Creative's environmental audio extensions. Um, it also has a 64 voice MIDI uh, synthesizer built in and it can do real-time digital audio effects like reverb, flange and chorus uh, in real time, um, which is awesome. So we'll be using this one in the build. This is a bit of a boring one, uh, but it's one that we're going to put in anyway. So this is a 3Com uh, Ethernet card. It is a 3C905C uh, network card. Um, this 10100, it's Ethernet. Uh, it works with Windows 98. It'll do the job. Uh, so we're just going to put this one in. The video card. 
Now you've seen this before, so I showed this in my last video where we did the introduction to the P2 board and the test. Um, so this is the ASUS, it's an NVIDIA River TNT2. Uh, it is the 16 megabyte, I believe. Uh, TNT2. Unfortunately it is the M64 version which is the crap version uh, but like I said the TNT2 Ultras are stupid expensive and I'm not going to spend that much money <laughs> on a video card from 1999 or whenever this came out. 19 yeah October 1999. Um, so this card supports DirectX 6 uh, which is great because the games on Windows 98 that will be running will be using DirectX 6. Um, so we'll be putting this in, installing the drivers and we'll do some benchmarking and some testing on this one as well. The power supply so I have a pretty much brand new ATX power supply uh, from 1999, I think. Um, it's a 250 watt switching supply. Um, this thing is like new. So I got this out of an ATX case that I picked up and the thing looked brand new, like it had barely been used. Uh, so, you know, I did the official tests, you know, made sure the power rails were good, got the multimeter out, everything looks good. Um, I haven't opened it to, to check caps, but it doesn't have that fishy smell of leaking caps, which is good. Um, I think this one's going to be okay uh, for a little while yet, so we'll be using this one in the build today. Um, the hard drive we're going to be using is a Maxtor. This is a 4.2 gigabyte drive. Um, so we'll be putting this in. We have a standard Panasonic 3.5 inch floppy drive. Nothing special here. And here uh, we have a Hitachi. It's a DVD drive. Um, it's not really era appropriate, but it's the best thing I could come up with. Um, I am hunting after a 32 speed uh, CD ROM drive uh, to go in this machine, which would make it much more era appropriate. Um, so I'll keep an eye out for one of those. Um, but in the meantime, uh, this DVD drive will do the trick. It'll get the OS installed. We can install some software and we can install some games and it'll work just fine for what we're doing here. And this is going to be the case we'll be using. So this is an ATX case that I picked up off eBay. It's the one that came with the power supply. Um, it is of the era. Um, it's ATX. It's got a lot of space in it. Um, it's very clean, um, which I'm very happy about. Um, no rust. It literally had almost no dust inside of it, just a little bit in the bottom, um, which leads me to believe this has either been well cleaned before it came through, um, or it hardly got used and sat somewhere out of the sun out of the way. Um, it even has the Pentium 2 badge on the front. Um, so this is era correct and appropriate, So, which is awesome. So we're putting a Pentium 2 inside the Pentium 2 ATX case today. So here you can see we have all the parts laid out. So we have the case, we have the motherboard with the CPU installed, the RAM is actually installed in the board as well. We have the video card, we have the sound card, we have the network card, the DVD drive, the hard drive, the floppy drive, the power supply, and some IDE cables. So we'll start here by putting the power supply into the case. The power supply goes into the top, uh, up here, in, the, in these old style cases. I remember when the power supply always used to be in the top of the case. So if you go back to the old AT, uh, tower, mid tower, full tower cases, the power supply was always in the top and then somewhere in the mid-2000s it moved to the bottom and it's kind of been there ever since. Um, I think it makes more sense to be in the top for heat dissipation, you know, the power supply can get quite warm and if you've got ventilation at the top it can also help to draw the heat out. So it just goes in with the four screws on the back like this. This power supply will be more than enough for a Pentium 2 uh, machine, 250 watts. It's a bit of overkill for these old machines. So that's done. So I'll just grab the motherboard. So here's the board. Uh, so we'll put this in. So the standoffs have already been screwed into the case, so we just need to place this in the box. So we'll put that in like this. It's a good idea to install the RAM while it's outside of the case. It's a lot easier to put it in. It's not hard to change it while it's in, but I just like to do it while it's out. So we'll put that in get that lined up with the I.O. shield on the back. Uh, it can be a little bit fiddly and there's little metal tabs that you need to move out of the way to get some of the ports aligned up. So we'll get that in. And it has these little plastic um, push pins that go in the top. These were part of the case. I haven't used these before but they were in the case with the mounting uh, holes so we'll just reuse those. And the rest of the board uh, will just be secured by some screws. So about three screws in the bottom I think. So I'll put that in. 
I think screws are way better than this used to be so if you looked at computers back in the 286 and 386 days you used to get these little plastic lugs that you'd have to pop through and then slide on to the bracket and then you'd push the board down onto the plastic lugs and to get a motherboard out of a case you had to use needle nose pliers to squeeze the plastic or nylon clips to get it out so we'll put the drives in now so I skipped ahead I've already put the drives in uh, we'll do the front panel wiring now so this is the hard drive LED, the power LED, power switch, uh, reset switch. So they'll go in there. And now we'll put the cards in. So the graphics card will go into the AGP slot. This is the TNT2. We'll put the sound card in next. The sound blaster live. I like to space them out evenly. Um, just leaves a bit of airflow. Looks nicer. Uh, don't like jamming them all next to each other, so we'll put that in. So there's the network card, all nicely spaced out. Get that in there. And then we'll secure these with some screws on the top. So I've got the brackets uh, to fill the blank spaces as well. I think it looks nice just to have all the brackets in there. I always get annoyed when I get cases uh, that don't have all the panel slots and the covers. Uh, so you end up with massive gaps for dust and shit to get into the back of your computer. And plus it looks nicer. Uh, we won't be installing any fans in this case. Um, I might see how the graphics card goes on the load. I know that the heatsink can get a little bit toasty but we'll see how temperatures go. I'm not sure if we need much airflow through this. Um, this card wasn't really designed to run with a fan, um, but we'll keep an eye on the temperatures when we do some benchmarking and see how that goes. So that's done. I'll screw the last panel in. Everything's in nice and tight. Okay, so the next thing we'll need to hook up some power. The Molex connector into the the hard drive. And we have another Molex connector for the DVD drive at the top and a floppy connector for the floppy drive. And we can put some IDE cables in. So this will be the IDE cable for the hard disk. We'll have another 40 pin IDE cable for the DVD drive and we'll have the IDE cable for the floppy drive as well. It's a little bit fiddly uh, to get into the floppy connectors once the board and everything's mounted, but we'll get it in there. Okay, so the connector goes into the floppy drive uh, you need to uh, keep an eye for where pin 1 is marked. So pin 1 on an IDE cable is marked by a red stripe on one side uh, and most of the drives will mark a pin 1 with a little uh, icon on the back. Um, the rule of thumb used to always be pin 1 red always towards the power connector uh, but I've noticed as time went on that doesn't really hold true all the time anymore. So. Um, if you're looking at 286s, 386s, 486 era gear, um, you're pretty safe to say pin 1 red stripe towards the power connector. Not so much anymore or with the later IDE stuff. Um, looks like manufacturers just took the liberty and oriented the power connector however they liked. Um, although a lot of the times it will be keyed, uh, so there'll be a little notch on the top and it'll only go in one way. But if you're in doubt, always check for the pin 1 marker. So just tidy that up a bit, cables are in. So that's that's everything connected uh, for this. So if we just give that a bit of a tidy up, not that we need any room for airflow in this thing, um, that should do the job. It's looking good. I like how clean this case has come up. Looks really good. It's just a shame about that DVD drive. So when I find a 32 speed CD-ROM, I'll be swapping that out the back, everything's clean, 
looks good. Nice and tidy. Let's wrap it up. Okay, so that's it guys, we're going to end the video here. So this is part one in the build. Um, we'll do a part two where we go through and install Windows 98, do some gaming, do some benchmarking. Um, so keep an eye out for video two and thanks for watching. See you next time.